Good evening uh, and welcome to the fourth talk in our series of lectures and discussions marking the centenary of Northern Ireland. Tonight's speaker is Paula McFetridge. Paula is an actor, director and pioneer of community theatre in Northern Ireland. She was a founder member of Tinderbox and for five years she was director of the Lyric Theatre. Today she is the artistic director of the brilliant Belfast based theatre company Kabosh. Uh, before I hand over to Paula, I would like to remind you all that um, you can ask questions in the Q&A box or even just leave a comment down below and we'll try and pose them at the end of the talk. So thank you for joining us tonight and I hope you enjoy Paula McBetridge. Good evening. Uh, thanks, Karen. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here. Um, I have been the artistic director of Gabash Theatre Company since 2006. Hard to believe. Um, and I thought what I'd do is I'd give you a brief overview about Kabosh, first of all, kind of what we do and what we don't do and how I think it fits in with the themes of this evening's talk. Uh, we perform theatre in we perform theatre in non-theatre spaces primarily. Uh, we believe in the politics of theatre to transform people's lives. So we try to see ourselves as artistic agents of social change. Our job is to ask difficult questions, to give voice to the unheard, to present new, new possibilities, facilitate communities in the reimagining of new possibilities. Uh, all of our work is inspired by the people, spaces and places in the north of Ireland. It's all commissioned from professional playwrights and our method of gathering source material varies. We do have community engagement elements and that runs alongside each project. Now, inevitably there are challenges to this work. Um, I don't necessarily see them as problems. I just think we need to then uh, reinvent the model of engagement on an ongoing basis. Um, we have to consider how we maximize access to single identity voices so that we're not only presenting these voices and stories back to those who own them. And this is very important whenever you're looking at commemoration or controversial material, which is some of the work I'm actually going to talk about this evening. Um, another challenge is how we open contested space. Because quite often what happens with spaces that we consider to be contested or single identity or primarily associated with a difficult past is that we have a perception of that space and we have a perception of the people that own that space. And one of the joys of the type of work that we do is we can perform in non-theatre spaces, contested sites, and bring people into those sites with a new narrative. Um, I also, what I'm primarily concerned with is not looking at verbatim theatre and not looking at living history. What we do is we gather first person narratives or we gather um, research that is uh, contained within literature that has been gathered by academics over the years. And then we reimagine it by working with playwrights. Um, we aren't prepared to be part of propaganda. And that's really important. We are not tools of government. We are about challenging the norm, but doing that within a package of care. But also we have to sympathize. Pain is personal. We didn't directly experience all of it, but we are individuals that have lived within our society as well. And so we have a package of care to our artists. So obviously I've been asked to talk about a hundred years of Northern Irish theater, um, but I'm a practicing theater director. I'm not an academic. And if we look at theatre over the past 100 years, a lot of the issues are cyclical. The same subject matter keeps coming up. Same issues of funding. I promise I won't mention the money word going forward, but same issues of funding keep coming up. Um, but the impact of our work is inevitably affected by the context of staging. And that is the year in which we live, our personal contexts our context in relation to uh, the epicentre of conflict or the epicentre of great social change. And I hope to, with examples I'm going to give this evening, explain what I mean by all of that. One thing I wanted to say before I go any further is there is a very useful book and it's a book called State of Play and it was produced by the Linen Hall Library many moons ago and uh, was created by a brilliant woman called Ophelia Byrne. And it looks at the theater and cultural identity in 20th century Ulster. And what she does in that book is she takes seminal productions uh, within the 20th century, 
but what she does is she looks at when the production was staged and why that makes it important. And for those of you that are interested in how the arts and politics collide and what makes different stagings different and have a different resonance and connect with new audiences, it's a really useful book to look at and you, and you can get it at the Lynn Hall Library. So what am I going to look at this evening? Well, I thought the best bet would be that if I take the work of Kabosh, given I know it personally, and also I can share examples of it with you, what I'm going to look at is work about borders. I'm going to look at the role of theatre in commemoration. I'm going to look at the role of theatre in dealing with the legacy of conflict, because that is a lot of the work that I would do. But I'm also going to look at the rise of cultural tourism, because I think that's a new thing, um, particularly over about the last 10, 15 years. And I think that's because of increased mobility. I think people are culturally curious. There are more people traveling to what they would perceive to have been conflict zones, or they can have access to those zones. Now. And it's how we use the arts to tell our own stories. And within all that, then I will look at site specific theater. Now, why do I think theatre has changed in the hundred years? I think you all probably know all of this as well. And I'm not, I'm not telling you things that you don't know. Okay. There is a diversification of investment sources. So uh, now there are a lot of projects that can be created to commission, to tender. There are a lot of organizations that see value of arts engagement with business, that also looking at arts and heritage connections and partnerships, that also looking at how we deal with the legacy of conflict and how we deal with commemoration and ask difficult questions. So that diversification of investment has changed what the arts are doing. Also our palettes have changed. We have, we, we have sophisticated tastes. We are used to different artistic engagements. We're used to experiencing theatre, as I say, in theatres and non-theatre spaces. But also we have new communication tools. If we look at the amount of technology that we have now embraced within the theatre sector, and I'll talk about that at the end of the talk as well, and I'll share some examples of our work. But inevitably, that helps us reach new audiences. That helps us tell new stories. And I think that... Uh, Theatre, within the theatre arena, we're always reconnecting. We're always trying to find new ways of telling stories that will reach new audiences and that also will encourage people to think differently whilst entertaining them. And so much of that is about looking at audience development, about ensuring that our practice cannot be labelled as a upper class benefit that's only for the higher echelons of society. Thankfully, the community arts sector um, in the north of Ireland is one of the most vibrant in Europe and always has been. And part of that is because of our emergence from conflict. And I think it has taught us a lot about how we engage with new audiences, how we tell new stories, how we are provocative, and yet how we look at community engagement that is deep, that isn't shallow, that isn't token. But then also because we are so sophisticated at how we use the arts to deal with the legacy of conflict and commemoration, a lot of our methodology is now celebrated around the world. And in Kibosh, we have shared our methodology nat nationally and internationally, particularly as regards how we deal with the legacy of conflict. And I'll come back to that as well. And um, as Karen said, uh, there will be an opportunity for questions at the end. Um, so what I thought I would do is, I was thought I would kickstart with a project, just given the title of the talk, looking at 100 years of Northern Ireland theatre, it is uh, pretty timely because uh, we are currently working on a project that uh, was commissioned from the National Museums of Northern Ireland. And it's a project to look primarily at partition and look at how we commemorate that and how we mark that moment. Now, commemoration can be a very difficult word. Often we think commemoration means celebration. But when we use the arts to commemorate or to mark an anniversary or to give a community time for a reflection, it is about telling the stories we haven't heard before. It is about humanizing those stories. It's about giving voice to those whose narratives we haven't engaged with because we feel that we don't have a connection with them or that we feel that um, we don't want to hear them. And quite often, once we put something into a three-dimensional form, with an emotional backbone, i.e. humanize it, then it's more difficult to switch it off. And once you hear something, you can't unhear it. Um, and quite often when it comes to uh, these, I suppose, more contested moments of history, uh, this is where artists can step in and ask the difficult questions. 
So what happened was NMNI, the museums, put out a public call for a tender to look at a project that would be based on research and that included oral archive and um, materials that are housed within the museum associated with the, um, with the whole partition of Ireland. And they, they asked us if we would take that and work with local artists and develop a project. So what we did was we commissioned uh, six short pieces for staging in six locations within both the Ulster American Folk Park in Oma and the Ulster Folk Park in Coltra. Now, as well as the live performances in each of these spaces in which an audience was led around between the different sites, we were also asked to film the project. So each of the six monologues were also filmed. And that then means that anyone around the world can hear this first person narrative reimagined by local artists and engage with how we are trying to address the question around partition and how we feel about it a hundred years on. And then also as part of that, Gabosh was responsible for, for training the first person and third person museum guides in both sites so that the show will have a life outside of this live, live experience. It's interesting how the museum pitched the project, what their marketing line was. And I thought I'd tell you what that was. It is the early, the early 20th century in Ulster was a period of upheaval. Communities were divided, lives were lost and borders were drawn. Borderline, the people's story tells the story of some of those people who were affected. It tells stories of loss, change and how, and how they adapted to new situations. And also with it, we remind audiences that this is difficult subject matter so they can prepare themselves before they experience it. Now, as I said, I'm a practitioner that deals within the live. So um, I have used technology, I'm not great at it, but thankfully I have my beautiful assistant this evening who is Stuart, who you're not going to see. And he's actually going to play a film, which is a short extract from each of the six monologues that we commissioned called Borderline, The People's Story, and it's looking at partition. After the armistice, I had hoped he might get better. But the reality of war was still very much around us. Limbless men, blind men, men whose minds were gone had all come home to remind us. Apart from Mark, John never left the house now. Around Europe, there was peace, but not in Ireland. We had our own personal war to keep us supplied with the sickening headlines of death and terror. The Belfast pogroms, the Lisburn pogroms, villages like Cushendall visited by terror and all set in tight by John. After partition, the violence continued in the north. The most appalling episode in 1922 was the massacre of the McMahons. John came home that night with a paper in hand and didn't say a word. He just stared and stared at the report. Head Constable Johnny Ferguson here. We've signed up dozens this week. We don't even have uniforms yet, but we have a very smart armband. Mummy, that's a very good question. But no, not a penny piece. You're doing it for king and country. No mercenaries required. You're here to fight the IRA. Because as you know, they're running a muck from the south across the new border. In the Armagh, Fermanagh, Tyrone, and London Delhi. And the Royal Irish Constabulary aren't doing a hand's turn to stop them. It's also our mission to prevent the vigilante groups heading to the border from Belfast and Lisbon. Aye, 
You, these specials, are here to stabilize the new Northern Ireland. At this rate, things are so volatile it could slide off the map. But I'm here to lead you, to inspire you, and to instill you with courage. The British government put a meandering border across the island of Ireland and for the first time ever, goods were not able to move freely across the country. Suddenly we had border posts and excise men and ordinary men and women who had never broken the law in their lives became smugglers. I found myself sewing hidden pockets into dresses and coats. My biggest sellers were extra large bloomers for transporting everything from tobacco to butter. People are very ingenious. A friend of mine lived right on the new border and she would take orders for people from the other side and they'd come and collect them when the excise men were gone. Most people think the border's an absolute nuisance. Nobody thinks it will last so everyone's making hay while the sun shines. And I thought, well, why not? The truth is, I helped everyone who came here. They were too scared to go to hospital for fear of being caught. Maisie Kennedy's husband arrived in a hell of a state because Maisie made a homemade bomb on her wee stove and it exploded in her face. And then there was John McKay, came in dripping blood from shrapnel, so I, I gave him iodine to clean out the wounds and pills for the fever. Oh, there were so many at our door. All through the night they came. Those poor, broken people. And sure, I know they've been attacking the police, but they're human beings and neighbours. I won't turn them away. Plus, and even more importantly, I don't want to be attacked for not helping them. If they set fire to us, there's that many chemicals in here, the whole street would be blown the kingdom come. Oh God, the disgrace of it. I told myself I'd stay at home from now on. But as the minutes, the hours ticked past, the thirst on me grew and when the clock clicked 12, that was me off like a sheepdog racing after the lambs. Into Riley's I went and it was all quiet. But for the regulars, what'll it be, Flossie? Said Brian behind the bar. A slab of butter and a wee poke of tea, I said. You just wait in the snug, he winked, while I get it ready. And I nipped in, closing the door from prying eyes. Brian passed me a wee sherry through the hatch and glug! <sighs> the fire down my thrapple right into my belly. Oh, the relief of it. Finally, I could forget about the gunshots at night. Scared the life out of me with Alfie and the bee specials roaming the land. Alfie's always said if partition doesn't last, everyone will be off to America. After the prisoners were released, I went back to doing what I do best. Organising rebellion. In the 1918 elections, Sinn Féin won a landslide victory and formed a breakaway government. Doyle Aaron and declared Irish independence. For most of this time, I was capturing as many weapons as I could, while the Doyle set about building a state. The British government outlawed the Doyle and Sinn Féin, and the conflict intensified. The War of Independence had arrived. In the northeast of the island, the conflict had a particular sectarian aspect. A mainly Protestant special constabulary had been formed and loyalist paramilitaries were active. They were attacking Catholics for IRA actions and in Belfast a sectarian war raged in which nearly 500 people were killed, mostly Catholics. I spent most of my time attacking black and tans and auxiliaries and getting weapons across the country. There was 
There's a great solidarity among Irish people where acts of civil disobedience, like railway men refusing to transport British forces or military supplies. I thought it would really help if I shared the footage, first of all, before I talk about it. What is, what is difficult when we look at commemorating uh, a, a period of history like partition is how we look at the human stories alongside the historical context for it pre and post. And what that's one of the great things that theatre can do is that it can ask the difficult questions. It can uh, humanize things that we, we uh, don't know of because they are the unheard of the silent stories. We can imagine those moments when change happens. We can, we can give a voice to them. Like for example, a moment when, when a society uh, has a ceasefire. What is that split second? What is that thing that goes through somebody's mind just as the ceasefire is about to happen? What is it that happens when a ceasefire falls apart? Those stories that we haven't gathered over the years. And it's difficult and we need to do it with a package of care. And um, like obviously within the company, we, we, we work very hard to do that. Because many moons ago, I was a member of the Salisbury Global Seminar and I was part of session 532. And it was a collection of people from around the world that worked within uh, conflict and post-conflict zones and a lot of us were involved in uh, commemoration and one of the things there was a brilliant young activist from uh, Sierra Leone and he talked about uh, the timeline where you are physically in any moment on that axis of geography and time to the epicenter of change and how that changes your perspective on it and uh, we were talking about as artists what are our roles within uh, examining our past, examining shared histories and examining single identity histories. And uh, he always said that, that uh, sometimes that our job as artists is to collect the first person narrative and the research for the next generation of artists to tell the stories because um, society will be at a point where they are ready to engage with those and hear them for the first time. And I am really interested in that idea of uh, how as artists we are aware of change and how we can provoke change and how we can be responsive to change. Uh, and a lot of that fits into the work of Gabosh. Um, it's also interesting when you talk about things like this that we need to talk about it not being necessarily balanced. It has to provoke. Because otherwise when we come back to these moments of commemoration, say, in 10 years time, when we're looking at the 110th anniversary of partition, we don't want to be asking the same questions again. We want to be asking different questions. We want to be asking better informed questions, questions that have a deeper engagement. There's no point in us coming back to each anniversary and each commemoration in a cyclical manner where we simply mark it. It is about having new conversations and facilitating that. A lot of the work of Gabash is within commemoration. And as we know, that model of uh, spectacle has been used to mark big commemorations over the years. And um, there is a really interesting, for those of you that are interested in this work, and I'm sure a lot of you know about it, um, I sit on the Decade of Centenaries Committee with the Community Relations Council. And out of that grouping, uh, there was a Creative Centenaries Toolkit so that we could look at best practice around how we mark those moments, which we all have different memories of, we all have a different relationship with, and to ensure that we have collective conversations around societal change and how we can be better informed citizens. And I would recommend you all to look at that. Um, we have done a lot of work within commemoration uh, during uh, 2016, as you can imagine, we were very, very busy during 2012. We were very, very busy, obviously, because of Titanic. And also in 2016, we had the anniversary of uh, the Easter Rising. We also had the anniversary of the song. And it was about, I was very interested in how, how could we create uh, projects, artistic engagement projects that would speak between communities. And I think that that's something that we are very literate in as artists in the North. And I think it is because of the seismic change that has happened within a, such a short period 
on our island and how we engage with it as artists. Um, there are there are other projects within Kabosh that that we have created over the years that have dealt with the concept of borders. Um, and I thought that an interesting way of me to move into other examples of our work would be to actually look at those. So rather than Stuart sharing the information with you, I'm actually going to try and share a PowerPoint with you with some footage. Um, and here's hoping it works. Um, OK, um, let me just get this up in front of me. Bear with me, bear with me, bear with me. Uh, okay. <laughs> I know I'm not doing it right. Okay. All right. I want to tell you about two projects. Now, hopefully you can see my screen and hopefully it's in full. And some of you may know of this project. This was a project that um, it took us many years. As I say, we've done a lot of work dealing with the legacy of conflict. And I'm really interested in the concept of uh, when is the when is potentially the right time to engage with a difficult narrative where more of our society are ready to hear it or ready to engage with it? And we've done several projects over the years. And one of the things I wanted to look at as regards uh, dealing with the past was the concept of policing. And whenever we do our uh, projects, we always work with multi multiple partners. And we worked with an organization called Diversity Challenges. And Diversity Challenges had created a project called Voices from the Vault, where over the years they had gathered the stories of serving RUC officers and serving on Garda Shia Khanna officers. But these officers or these archives would have sat in an archive somewhere. And only those who either know the stories or are interested in engaging with them would have connected with them. And it's similar to how I would have my conversation, say, with the museums about the partition project. It's great that all this research exists, it's great that they house it, but unless, it, unless you find a way of animating it, of taking it into communities, then quite often uh, only the chosen few will engage with that. And that's what would have happened with the archive of first person narratives from the police. If diversity challenges hadn't decided to um, commission an artist to reimagine these stories, okay? And so uh, what I should say about the project is the project is called Green and Blue because it is based on the color of the two uniforms, okay? So blue was worn by Angarda Shia Khan in the South and green was worn by the RUC in the North. And uh, as I said, it was all first person narratives of uh, men who had served on the border and they were all men. Um, and thankfully, as we find with our pieces, this piece has become a catalyst for women now starting to share their stories. Now, because it's contested, it is really important that those people who own the stories or who, who or family members of those who own the stories feel involved in the project. So uh, over a 15 month period, we had a committee of uh, serving and ex-RUC officers, serving and ex and Garda Shia Khanna officers who uh, worked with us as the script developed and who we shared several readings with. Because there's no point in us creating something um, where, where those that are off the community cannot be ambassadors for it and can't share it. And a similar process would happen with the likes of partition for the museums. We would work with a committee that looks at the authentic, the authentic realization of the material. And that's how you can ask the difficult questions because it is based on fact and because there is a element of truth at the core of it. And Green and Blue is one of those projects that we have toured extensively since 2016. Um, we have we have brought it to numerous countries all around the world, um, and I'm going to share the trailer of it with you now. They call it the Black North. Should have called it the Cold North. Could you ever imagine that just a few? miles north a car could be this cold. I get travel sick in the back of the jeep. Sometimes I wondered if it was really claustrophobia. Four men shut inside a tin can with only a dim overhead light, breathing in the stale and recirculated air. 
knowing there was nothing you could do but endure the bone-shaking journey in a vehicle built for survival rather than comfort. At one point we took on a role that then became an identity. And that identity now defines us. I'm no longer Eddie, nor you, David. I'm a guard, you're a peeler. We are a uniform. Not real people. And rightly or wrongly, we now view the world from that perspective. It's a strange feeling. That of being hunted. It's not like driving into a random ambush. That way, you're an anonymous target. But when you know someone is specifically targeting you... Watching your movements. Compiling a dossier with your name at the top of it. Seeking an opportunity to kill you. Also, this part of the field can join that part of the field. Do you think it will ever end? Now, um, as you can imagine, it was a very, very difficult process, but around this whole project, we had numerous conversations about um, uh, the border, about how the border came about, about how, how partition in Ireland affected families across the island. And it was a really interesting project because what we were looking at was personal narratives. We were humanizing narratives. We were taking those narratives to communities that had never engaged with them. And we had multiple conversations. Um, I'm just realizing I need to move the thumbnail so that you can read these. Um, we worked with a, with a playwright called Lawrence McKeown. And, uh, and the two actors that were with us from the very, very beginning of this project uh, stayed with it actually right to the end. We did a four week residency in Edinburgh. We've toured it to Brussels, we toured it to Paris. We toured it to Dresden, we toured it all over the world. And really interestingly, because it's a human story, it led to other people talking about their relationships at borders. It is very hard hitting the minute the two characters come out on stage in their uniforms. Um, there is a visceral reaction to it from audiences. We have performed it in theatres, non-theatre spaces. We've performed it in abandoned prisons. We've performed it in community centres. Um, in very, very different communities. We performed it for uh, loads of ex-guards. We performed it for loads of RUC, current, current RUC, um, or sorry, current PSNI. And on each occasion, we always do a post-show discussion. And we would do that with a lot of our work. It's really important we evaluate impact so that we can articulate how this difficult work does create new conversations. And similarly with the project around partition that we're doing in the museum, that is what we will continue to do. I think that is a, a new thing within theatre. I don't think there would have been a legacy of looking at kind of post-show engagement in the way that we currently do it now. And it's about that responsibility, that package of care for our audiences. Um, uh, as you can see, I mean, the kind of feedback on it has, has always been incredible. And uh, for any of you that are interested in that project and want to know more about it and want to know about the archive, please, please just get in touch with this. This is the type of evaluation form that we would use. We have found a means of um, uh, articulating both qualitative and quantitative impact. And I think it's very important when you're dealing with issues that, that are, are as controversial as these. Um, as you can see, um, then, then we're able to map um, people's reaction and change to, to the issues within the piece. Um, it's a piece we're incredibly proud of. Um, but also what's really interesting, we like as I say, we, we have toured it internationally. We had a Nigerian delegation came to Belfast to experience it. And one of the things they said to us is that they could never imagine themselves doing a play about policing. And I said, six years prior to us doing this, I didn't think our society was necessarily ready to ask difficult questions about policing. And so the context wasn't ready for us then either. Um, the other project that I wanted to briefly touch on used a very similar methodology and also talks about borders and it was a project called Lives in Translation and Lives in Translation similarly we worked with a community and gather their stories and on this project we worked with Somalian um, asylum seekers 
based in the north of Ireland and we work we interviewed their support workers as well and similarly we wanted to look at their relationship with borders how they had crossed international borders national borders local borders and um, tell their story and uh, we staged this particular piece that ended up being uh, written by Rosemary Jenkinson and uh, the Somalian uh, people who do donated their stories also sat in in the rehearsals with us and this is a short trailer for it, actually, just to give you an idea of how it looked. You're part of the asylum industry. It's not. I'm a very expensive commodity. Don't you forget it. Something is always lost in translation. I had a choice to kill myself, to kill or be killed. What choice is that? Something is always lost in translation. I'm still here. Ten years. Ten years lost in the system. I fled war. Now I'm in a battle. Across the back of the stage for this, we had 10 years, one month, 25 days, nine hours, 13 minutes and 15 seconds. And this particular clock that was on stage the whole time kept changing. And it was about the length of time that our protagonist had spent in Ireland, being moved north and south, crossing the border, moving across borders between here and elsewhere and uh, telling her story. It was about humanizing a very, very difficult narrative. It was about putting into a three-dimensional form somebody whose narratives we have no, no understanding of. And through that, helping us consider this idea of um, uh, how do we become active citizens within an inclusive society? What is it that we are offering those that are ending up on our shores? And, and how, how welcoming we are being to them. Uh, we started this piece off and we did it in container lorries as part of the Belfast Festival, and then we toured it around courtrooms. Uh, all across the north of Ireland and into the south as well. Uh, again, the impact on it was incredible. Um, but what is interesting about it, quite often the uh, audience members in the post-show discussion would look around the audience and say, this is a very wide audience. And I would say, um, it's actually not those that are affected that need to hear this narrative. It is the wide audience, those that have no direct experience, that need to be better educated, need to have a greater knowledge. And again, I find that with a lot of our work, that, that quite often, by engaging artists to deal with this subject matter, we're able to take these stories to new people. Again, we used a very similar evaluation form to look at uh, the, the quantitative and qualitative impact of the work. As you can see, we set baselines. We ask people how they feel about key questions before and after the performance. Um, and again, we're then able to quantify kind of, you know, uh, uh, how people feel about it. Um, I'm going to stop the share on this for a minute. Okay, so you're back to me. Um, I'm conscious the time's going to kind of flit along on me. Um, so what else did I want to talk to you about? Yeah, like current trends. The other trends that are currently really interesting that, that I don't think would have existed within the theatre 100 years ago, in fact, they definitely wouldn't, is the drive towards site-specific work, this drive towards installation work, this drive toward kind of pop-up guerrilla tactics. And of course, there's also the place, still the place for kind of um, theatre housed within theatres, like the Lyric, but also when you have that kind of mainstream repertory theatre, that is what the independent sector are uh, responding to. But the other thing that's very interesting is that because there is greater mobility of people around the world, there's been a massive rise in cultural tourism uh, and particularly political cultural tourism, which which obviously um, we are very interested in in Kibosh because of the type of work that we do. Um, and we have worked with, again with multiple partners over the years. Uh, for, you know, for example, for the new opening of Hillsborough Castle and Gardens, we were asked to look at their research material and animate historical figures and give them a contemporary feel and bring them alive in a way that uh, humanised them, but also didn't make them anodyne. It didn't make them um, neutralised. Um, 
kind of showed them warts and all. And I think that's what audiences engage with. We also, we did a project down at Castle Well and Castle um, uh, that looked at Mabel Ainsley that a lot of people didn't know about. They brought an audience on a journey from the gardens into the castle. Um, and then also we have done a lot of uh, political tourism. And I just want to briefly touch on uh, how we have used technology to do that. Um, and there is a specific project called Streets of Belfast. Now, what I'm going to do is, let me just one second while I do this without hitting on the wrong button. I'm gonna go into here. Okay, share. All right, now this is, um, this is a project that uh, again was a long time in the making. Okay, but what we did was, and we were funded by the tourism board to do this. We, instead of, um, uh, I, I suppose, tampering with history or tampering with that, uh, with people's personal testimonies, what 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 we were asked to do was um, to actually take the political tours that were existing within. Um, uh, the Falls Road and within the Shankill Road, and we were asked to create animated walking tours. These tours come with a health warning. What you will hear for the next three hours and witness for the next four or five miles is my interpretation of history. So take it and listen, and when you go back to where you're from or where you came from, try and develop your own understanding of what you've heard and seen today. Okay. So that person that you just saw there is a tour guide from Koistia, which is a uh, umbrella organization for uh, Republican ex-prisoners. And we worked with them on the Falls Road and we worked with SASH, which is the Shankill Area Social History Group on the Shankill Road. And we took the tours that they were already doing. And what we did was we commissioned short dramas on key locations along those walking tours that put their first person contemporary narrative into a historical context. So it's looking at, uh, again, that thing I was saying at the very, very beginning, it is about context. It's how we take history and use it to provide a, a framing device for our contemporary first person narrative so that we can humanize the past. And what we did was we, we created a GPS tracking device so that people could then walk the length of both of those roads whenever the tours weren't on and would have access to archive footage of the roads, would have access to the first person narrative, would have access to uh, the new dramas that we'd commissioned and experience the roads as they exist now, while also being able to see and experience what they used to look like. And also through the technology, the, the, those that attended the event were able to access additional material that had been archived through the University of Ulster, through the uh, Cain website, through um, the Linen Hall Library, through the library service. So they were able to build their own picture around what they were witnessing whilst they went, went on this particular journey. It is a really interesting project because it is about allowing the first person narrative to exist and the stories to exist as the community, so, are, so, the, so the communities can tell them themselves and have faith in the story that they are telling. But also it is about putting a context around that that uh, deepens the viewer's engagement with it. Uh, those particular experiences, now we have created a, uh, we, we were funded by the tourist board to have a, a particular element of our website where you can actually do the tour. Um, now, the advantage of that is for those people within our communities and those people nationally and internationally that, that want to hear how we are telling our own histories, that don't feel safe enough to yet go into those communities, that don't particularly want to go into those communities, or that don't have the means to go into those communities, can actually experience the first person narratives and the stories of those communities from the context of their own homes, from their own sofas. And that is an incredible gift to be able to give people um, as regards how they engage with Irish, British, Ulster history and how we can use the arts to do that. 
prior to us being able to use this immersive technology, we would not have been able to do that. And it has become an incredible educational tool and is used in various universities throughout the States and within conflict zones. As I say, we have toured our work to Rwanda, South Africa, Nigeria. Um, we have shared the methodology of conflict resolution within the global landscape. And it is a great gift that we can give to the rest of the world about how we have used the arts to deal with contested histories, to deal with the concept of commemoration, to, to look at dealing with the legacy of the past. Because the other thing that we have discovered is, is that the narrative of um, conflict is universal. We're all dealing with the same issues. We want to ensure we don't pass on the cycle of violence to the next generation. We want to ensure that um, we don't step on the memory of a dead loved one. How do we, how do we remember without memorializing? Um, if, we, uh, if we remember, can we forgive? Which is a massive question that keeps coming up for us. How can we bear witness to the stories of the victims, the perpetrators, the combatants, the family members, um, and how, how all of those different narratives need to be heard in order for us to have a deeper understanding of who we are and where we came from. Now, I would say, and um, like it is very challenging working in an environment such as the North of Ireland, but given the work that I am currently interested in and given Kabash's commitment to confronting issues head on that are of social and political importance, Living where we are is also an incredible opportunity. I always say, if you, if you can't imagine a provoc provocative artistic response to history, space and community in Belfast, well, where else can you do it? Um, there are multiple stories still to be told. There are misconceptions that need to be grappled with. There are sensitive issues that the media and politicians can't or won't address. There are contested spaces and there are narratives to share. I'm acutely aware of the responsibility of the artist. There is a time to tell a story, a time to challenge, a time to simply give a voice. Um, and with experience, we become better at knowing when the best possibility for deep engagement can be. Our main job at the moment is we need to really ensure that our theatre sector remains alive to tell the tale, particularly coming out of what we're coming out of. Um, I think that we, we, we recognize the need for communal engagement. I think hopefully we recognize what an invaluable role the arts can play within our society. And I think particularly within a society like ours that has suffered so much in such a short period of time. And I think coming out of the decade of centenaries and given what is coming at us down the line, I think using arts to challenge preconceptions is invaluable. That's me. 10 to 8. Kieran. <laughs> That's wonderful. <clears throat> Thanks very much, Paula. It was really, really interesting. Um, we have a few questions there on the Q&A, and I'd invite anyone else who has a question to, to drop it in there, and we'll try and get to it. Um, I'm going to be a bit cheeky and ask the first question. Um, and so when I listen to you and, and, and doing a bit of reading, um, one of the things that struck me is the importance of geography uh, and place to, to what you do. I read that you took green and blue to Girdwood, the former British Army uh, base. Is there something um, <clears throat> in particular you see an advantage taking something be beyond the theatre out into into the community? Is there something that is there something about place that affects our understanding or potential for change? Um, I'm just interested to hear your thoughts on it. Massively. So, um, one of the one of the first major site specific projects I ever did was back in 2000 and it was a project called Convictions and it was before I was with Kabosh and uh, I did it with Tinderbox and it was a promenade project that took place in Crumlin Road Courthouse and one of the reasons why um, there was the potential for the project was there was, was uh, Crumlin Road Courthouse was, um, was up for redevelopment and uh, they had the foresight at the time to think that what artists could do was help our communities imagine new possibilities for that site. So if, if you take a arts project into a space that has a history, 
it breathes new life into it. But what is key is you need to allow the, the history of the location to exist alongside the project. So quite often what I will do is I will consider the, the kind of bricks and mortar and the site to be the past. I would imagine that the work that we are putting in is a potential reimagining or a new future for that site. And then the audience or the present. And it allows those three things to sit together so they can ask different questions. Now, that is one way of using the type of work that we do. The other thing, as you rightly say, we, we uh, premiered Green and Blue in the former Girdwood Barracks, which is now an art centre. And um, it's because I believe within bricks and mortar, buildings have a life, they have an existence. They, there is a difficulty with, with their former identity on occasions. And it is about animating them, uh, almost, almost purging them so that we can ask new questions. We can engage in new narratives. We can move the narrative forward. The other thing as well is that when you take a theatre in to find spaces, people are curious about the spaces and so they might tend to come to theatre. Mm -hmm. like for example, we did a, for, for uh, two years, uh, my former colleague interviewed members of the Jewish community in Belfast and uh, uh, Joe Egan. And then over that period of time, then those narratives were given to a playwright and we commissioned a play and we staged it in the... Um, in the uh, synagogue in Belfast. Now, so few people knew there even was a synagogue in Belfast. Mm -hmm. Some people were really curious about sight. So they came to see that play in a synagogue because they wanted to see the synagogue. And then they had the bonus of seeing the play. And then they engaged with that whole community in a very, very different way because they were better informed and entertained and educated on a mobile swoop. But also, I think as artists, we are always committed to breaking down barriers to access. So when you take theatre into a community, it also means more people have the potential of engaging with it. And particularly when you're dealing with difficult subject matters, people are more receptive to engaging with it, potentially in a single identity setting where they are, for want of a better turn or phrase, with their own. And I think that we need to be cognizant of when that has to happen, because I think then the conversations are deeper and better informed. Okay, that's, that's really interesting. And actually Ian Reynolds has asked a, a question to relate to that. He said, um, when is the wrong time to bring up a difficult issue or topic? Um, has Kabosh ever got it wrong? Oh. Uh, what can't be talked about now, if anything? Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Um, it's interesting, uh, like Lives in Translation, that project I mentioned where we, where we worked with the Somalian community, I postponed that project three times okay. because issues were coming up as regards, um, like I'm sure a lot of the people that are watching this um, uh, remember whenever there was the disgraceful burning out of all the Roma families um, and uh, we were all of a sudden back in the news headlines for, for, for uh, the kind of racism that was happening within Belfast and particularly within the north of Ireland as well. It was an incredibly volatile subject and I felt that yes we needed to comment on um, racism within our society and I felt that Lives in Translation was very well placed to do that. I just felt that it would have been sensationalist for us to have staged it at that time. And I wanted then, that's when then we started to reassess where the project was going to be staged. And that was then why we decided to move it into courthouses so that we could tour it in spaces across the North. I think that um, it's interesting that that idea of when is the wrong time. It's, um, you kind of, there's no such thing as an original idea. And I always say that. Uh, we're all thinking of similar subjects. And the minute you start working on something, you start seeing it in the newspapers, you start seeing it in the media, you see other people are talking about it. There is, a, there is an energy about when to tell stories. Um, uh, the story I tell about potentially when was the wrong time is um, when the Oma bomb happened, um, the, there was a fictional drama was commissioned um, about the Oma bomb. And I remember the families at the time uh, requesting to the production company, it wasn't the right time to be able to tell that story truthfully because it would have tampered with the judicial system. Mm -hmm. So that is a simple way of when is the wrong time. Um, and I always panic about um, when, when is the right time to tell a story. But when things start falling into place or when you start asking questions and people are working on the same subject matter, it is the right time. And then you will find the form in which to tell that story. And then also the key question I always ask myself is, 
Why are we telling the story? What is it that we're bringing to the table that another theatre company or another production company can't bring to the table? Like our recent project, The Shedding of Skin, is about women as a tool of war. That took me four years to develop because I was so aware of needing to find the right form to tell it in, the right team to put on it, and, and to, to tell it within an international context that didn't allow it to become parochial. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, and uh, I suppose you might want to answer this, you mightn't. Um, Ian follows up. Um, you know, the questions you might avoid for funding issues. Um. <laughs> <laughs> if I tell everybody that, then it'll just happen all the time. <laughs> questions you have to avoid. Um, I think that that uh, it's really interesting because I always refer to our work as being controversial and provocative because I see that job as that's our job as artists. And inevitably what I have to follow it up with is, is but also I do it with a package of care mm -hmm. and I do it by surrounding ourselves with the best at their job. People who are experienced in this. We work with um, gatekeepers within the community to ensure that we don't re traumatize. We don't take it to communities that are potentially ready to hear it. We also work with agencies that provide a package of care for both the artists involved and uh, for those that share their stories with us. And um, there's a kind of a there's such a collective drive when you do this. And um, so quite often using words like provocative can freak the funders out. Uh, con controversy freaks the funders out. Um, and yet the mad thing is that that's what excites, excites the touring venues and or the partners. Um, I don't think, um, I think there are different funders for different projects. And I think over the years, because we have gained a respect for the quality of our work, for example, organizations like the Department of Foreign Affairs are very receptive to the work that we do because they see the, the worth of it. But also what I've done over the years as well is that we've now created projects that we can revive so that, that, that we, we get the show up. We are very clear about what it's about. We don't... Um, we don't soft soak the message. You have to make sure you get the brand right. You have to be clear if it's difficult. You have to put age uh, guidance on it. You have to put warnings on it, like we did with the shedding of skin recently, so that an audience is prepared. Um, and then when we revive it, we have all that information to hand. So then that when we're, we're uh, sending it out into more communities or we're taking it to new spaces, um, we, have, we have the material that goes with it, but yes. I just don't tell the funders certain things, Ian, to be honest. <laughs> I think audiences are, are, are very sophisticated. They know when you're avoiding something, you know, um, sometimes audiences can be ahead of institutions or funding bodies and, and they have a way, in my experience, of, of keeping you a little honest. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, is there anything, uh, Patrick's asking this question, are there any artists or theatre groups from the past that have particularly influenced uh, your work with Kabosh? Oh, yes. The wonderful Sharabang Theatre Company. Uh, when I was in the Ulster Youth Theatre way back in, when I was 16, um, 15, 16, 17, Sharabang Theatre Company, for those of you who don't know, most of you probably do know, was a theatre company that was set up by five incredible women because they, they wanted to create a means whereby they could do their own work. And that was Mary Jones, Carol Moore, Eleanor Methvin, Mo McCauley, Brenda Winter, and I've left one out. I can't think who it is. Anyway, it'll come back to me. But they, but they actually created work. A lot of it arose from a gathered oral archive, and and telling the stories of the communities to which they were taking plays. But then also they toured internationally, like they, like they toured to the to the um to Russia way back in the day, like like incredible tours. But also they would do that, and then they would take shows into community centres. They were incredible. They inspired me a lot. I remember them coming to talk to me in youth theatre, and me thinking they're the people I want. Another organization was an organization called Brif Goff from Wales, who created these kind of mad installations, these kind of spectacles involving music, spoken words, movement, some, some kind of grotesque carnival type stuff. Uh, and they used to perform in old warehouses and tell stories of um, stories about borders and stories about um, history and war and conflict. And, and they were just incredible. And I remember seeing them when I was at university. Um, and then there's just been key individuals, you know, people like what Gary Hines has done with Druid, what Lynn Parker has done with Rough Magic. Um, you know, seeing, seeing work in the lyric when I was really, really young, you know, and um, so yeah, there's various ones over the years and people still continue to influence me. Actually what influenced me most now is I think 
I think the wealth of talent within our young practitioners here, like some of the actors I've worked with on the partition project and on shedding of skin that are coming to the fore, all in their early thirties, who just have a voice, have a talent, have a skill, and we should be embracing them. And then similarly, our playwrights, I mean, you know, the kind of legacy of writing in Ireland is just like beyond the scale, as we all know. And I think yeah. that um, we're very, very lucky. Mm -hmm. Okay. And um, there's a, I don't know if it's a question or a comment, but it's so interesting. I need to read it out from, from Donal. Um, he says, I wonder if there's a failure by younger generations to value and validate those of us who find ourselves in our 60s and 70s. We were on the original civil rights marches, including at Burnt Hollet in 69. We were outside the British Embassy in 72. We negotiated and drew up the 85 and Good Friday Agreements. It's as if we are doing such things for the first time. If we don't know it from history, we are surely condemned. It seems like we should have Donal on for a talk. It's Absolutely. Very interesting. Right. You know what I should say to Donal is, um, I, I, I completely agree with you. I think the cyclical aspect of activism can be so disheartening. Yeah. I find I'm, I'm raising questions now and I'm asking questions now that I asked, you know, way back when I was kind of 20 with Tinderbox or working with the circus or working with various community arts organisations and um, issues of sectarianism, of oppression, of human rights issues to do with poverty, to do with civil rights, exactly as you say, Donal. I think that um, there are so many um, festering issues within our society that... Um, that we still haven't dealt with. And I think that's because too often in the past we've had shallow engagement. We haven't had deep long-term engagement that bears witness to those from our society that fought the good fight and asked the difficult questions. And I think a lot of that happens within a, um, a post-conflict society. I think as we talk a lot about winners and losers um, and we, we, we feel the need to have one central narrative that we can all agree on that we're terrified of asking the difficult questions and shaking things up and um, but on a positive note we had a series of panel discussions as part of the shedding of skin and one of the panel discussions was uh, curated and tailored by young people so they were all under 25 and they were talking about because the piece was about women as a tool of war and about um rape within conflict uh, both against um, combatants and perceived uh, um, victims and uh, also by government and also within like a legal war uh, but anyway the reason why I say this they wanted to do a panel discussion about consensual sex and they wanted to talk about sex education in schools and they wanted to talk about gender identity and they kept coming back to this idea that they only do what they do because of the activists that went before them and that there must be better arenas whereby the actor, the activists with knowledge get celebrated and promoted, but then also they become the mentors for the new voices coming through so that then we can celebrate the fact that we have a legacy of activism. I think we very often forget that. Um, as the wonderful Inez McCormick, one of our great activists said, our big question we always should be asking ourselves is who is not at the table? And what these young people said was, those that aren't at the table are the elderly activists because they're terrified of the older ones and the younger ones getting together because that would be the perfect storm for change. Um, a couple of quick fire questions. Yeah. Uh, Councillor Tinsley asks, um, can all the clips of the drama documentary be viewed online anywhere? Yes, they can. Actually, all in different places, which is something that I'm trying to centralise. The, the uh, NMNI films, all the partition films can be seen on the NMNI website. Look for uh, border, Borderline the People's Story. Also, it's live this weekend in Coltrane. So if any of you have an hour to spare on Saturday or Sunday. We've got four shows on Saturday, four on Sunday. Come and see it live. It's theatre mm -hmm. after all. Um, the Green and Boo, uh, you'll be able to access it through the Kibosh website. And for those of you that are interested in a full length recording of that, if you email me, I'll send it to you and you can look at it privately. Um, we're hoping to revive that show. Similarly with Lives and Translation, I have a full recording of it, as well as the trailer. We don't put the full recordings out because obviously our primary thing is um, uh, live theatre. I have a full recording of Shedding of Skin and various other things. So never be shy of dropping us an email. And, um, Perhaps we could email that out in the next week or so. We could get some of the links off you and, and maybe email them out to everybody. Absolutely. So yeah. you said quick fire and I talked for ages. So <laughs> what else do you want to um, ask? Sarah Duncan asked, uh, will you perform in the women's prison in Armagh? 
I'm not sure if you have or just, there's lots of stories and, and there are. I spent um I spent two years working on a project with Rita Duffy for the women's prison in Armagh. And um uh, it was supposed to be a site-specific project inspired by the children of Lear that looked at the idea of um mental and physical escape and uh, the idea of narratives running within you and your DNA of culture. And unfortunately what happened was there was a redevelopment of the site that was pushed through before the project was made to happen. But I completely agree with you. I think it is a site that is quite incredible. I spent an awful lot of time there. Um, and I think that too often with a lot of those sites, back to what, what um, Ian was saying earlier, that that like sometimes uh, we're so terrified of, of the stories that we as a society connect with sites that we see as contested that we 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 prefer to shut them down rather than i suppose uh l- lease a new life into them and um, just to take a quick side step so we have a contemporary collecting project uh covid19 and me it's all about collecting the history of the pandemic and it seems that your play King of East Belfast should be included because if, if it was billed as the first socially distanced play. You, you set it up last last summer. Um, I don't know if you could talk briefly about that experience. Yeah, um, King of East Belfast came. Uh, Stephen Beggs, brilliant uh, writer, performer, he's worked with me a lot. Um, Stephen was, uh, he was very interested in the narratives of his in-laws. Uh, like I know never work with your in-laws or with animals or children and uh, he he like decided to do all of this and interview <laughs> his father-in-law and look at his father-in-law's family and their history of small trades businesses and um, in East Belfast and uh, uh, he his 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 wife's grandfather was known as the king of East Belfast and he basically was uh, ran a bookies business and uh, Stephen wanted to tell the story so anyway we commissioned the play it's going to be a one-person show uh it was the we were in the middle of the, we were in the middle of the first wave of the pandemic and the wonderful cons water shopping center uh said that they would host it and because we were hosting it in a public space like that that had full parking full security um full sanitation we, we were able to do the show there and again what we underestimate is a lot of the production crews that we would work with because they're used to performing in the bizarrest of spaces on shoestring budgets and and liaising with multiple stakeholders they put in place a full COVID assessment and we had a socially distanced audience who were all masked which i think we, under, we underestimate how difficult that is for a performer it's nearly as bad as giving a talk on zoom but you can't see everybody so for the performer this was all they could get so they had no idea whether an audience was like it or not audience were all socially distanced one way in one way out and um and the show was just incredible it just it just really worked and connected to people but what i do want to tell you about it is is that whenever the manager um of Conswater first showed me around and um, he brought me into the old the old uh, Northern Bank or the old Ulster oh, Northern Bank the old Ulster Bank in um in in Conswater and right in the middle of the unit there is an electric shutter so all he had to say to me was imagine when the audience come in and they all sit in their seats with their masks on and they haven't been to theatre for six months and all they hear is and the shutter goes up right and it's like the curtain rising on theatre again for the first time. And Stephen is the actor was on the far side, but you could hear this collective intake of breath mm. and the audience thanking us afterwards for having made it happen. So it was a combination again with all these projects. It was partners. It was Eastside Arts Festival. It was Conswater. It was Arts and Business for funding it. It's the imagination of an artist like Stephen and then a great crew who could do a COVID assessment just like that. And turn it around and make everybody feel safe and welcomed. Brilliant. Sounds fantastic. Um, so last question, and we've asked this, I think, to, to everybody who've been on as part of our series. Um, so if you were to be a representative for the arts, um, and we're looking at um history of Northern Ireland 100 years from now, um, we're a museum, we're very interested in objects and exhibitions. Um, so what objects from the last hundred years from the broad arts community would you put in that display not to put you on too much of the, of the spot there Bob so well, you, you kind of prepped me for everything else and then you just hit me with the hardest question to see if yeah. I can pull it out of the bag and uh, now I'm just talking so I can think um well what would I put in it um 
would State of Play make it in there? Would that be? I think I think State of Play is a really interesting book. Now, obviously, like I assisted on it, but I think it's very clever and off its time. And I think it's so user friendly because it has a, a political timeline along the bottom of it. So, you know, the context of each production. Yeah. I think it would go in. I think I would probably put in. Um, I probably put in a, a, a handwritten copy of Digging by Shane Okay, yeah. I think I would probably put in, oh, Paddy Galvin's play, We Do It For Love, okay. which was one of the first ever oral archive plays. And it was staged in the lyric, I think probably about 74, 75. Okay. Uh, really interesting piece for anybody that doesn't know it. Paddy was a, was a cork man um, and was never really staged again. It's so worth doing. I would put in Somewhere Over the Balcony by Mary Jones and Charity Bank Theatre Company. Okay. Uh, it's like an eloquent poem that celebrates the Belfast vernacular and tells a really interesting story. Um, from Kabosh, I would probably put in, oh, it's very controversial, what do I choose? I would put in a copy of Belfast by Moonlight, and it's a show I didn't mention this evening. Belfast by Moonlight was a show we staged in St George's Church on High Street to mark the 400th anniversary of Belfast. And it was a, um, I've forgotten the word for it. It's a, it is virtually, or, or it's, it's a poem that is set to music. And it was written by Carlo Geibler with music by Neil Martin. And we had a community all-female choir. And it celebrates five women, all fictional, who all represent a different period in Belfast history. And they come back to the church to say their farewells. And um, yeah. It just was one of those projects that I suppose was, I mean, I'm a Belfast girl through and through, and it just kind of celebrated everything about this city, but also didn't let us shy away from oppression, uh, the cost of industrialization, um, gender violence in the city, um, sectarianism, and yet it did it in this beautifully poetical way that made you think and feel differently, whilst in this incredible setting that so many people had never been in. Wow. Okay, that was pretty thorough. Um, for thinking <laughs> off the top of your head, that was pretty good. Ask again for asking me a question. Yeah, no, that, that that's really interesting. And actually, I just want to say thank you for for um coming on tonight and, and speaking to us and making um the art so accessible, but um telling a really interesting uh story and sharing your work and it's been uh, really fascinating. Um, I'm seeing some of the comments in here. I think everyone else agrees. It was really interesting. Um, I just want to say thanks very much to the Heritage Fund's Shared History Fund for um, supporting uh, the talk tonight. Um, a quick plug for um, our website and our next speaker, which is uh, Professor Fergal McGarry, and he's talking about the killing of Sir Henry Wilson on the 11th of October. Um, so really looking forward to that. I'm going to follow up with an evaluation email and hopefully we'll get some links off Paula um, and we'll send them out for some of their performances. And maybe Paula, be, be, I could pass over to you if there's anything you'd like to, to point us towards over the next year or six months. Main thing is, uh, if, if you're interested in our work, the easiest way to do it is just to sign up to our newsletter. We do a monthly newsletter. It is very informal, but it tells you like it tells you everything that's coming up uh, and you can do that on www.kabosh.net if you're interested in the borderlines project come along this weekend i promise you it's a beautiful experience 75 minutes long to get some fresh air and as well and uh the other thing is is obviously follow us on social media for those of you that are interested and um and don't all get in touch because there is a civil rights project that i've been working on for a while there you go. thank you very much paula thank you very much everybody for joining us um Good evening, and I'll see you all uh, on October the 11th with Professor Fergal McGarry. Thanks very much.